Hello and welcome to the fourth iteration of the Foundations of Machine Learning Programming Lab. In this course, we're going to take a look at base classification. So, more specifically, we will develop a naive base classifier using NumPy only. So, the first step, as always, is to go ahead and import NumPy. As data for this week, we are going to use text data for the first time. So the code block below already has some code, uh, which is preload, so you don't have to uh, wrap your head around different vectorizations for text. Um, but I will stop, step through all these different uh, lines here regardless to explain you what's going on. The first thing is that we're going to use the 20 news groups dataset, which is uh, a multi-label um, dataset, which means it contains about 20 topics. And um, the text in there are newsgroup postings. So online forum posts by people on certain topics. Um, we will have an example shortly. And uh, these are multi labeled so they have 20 different classes, but uh, only one at a time. So if you're multi-class, single label setting here. So I will first uh, execute this so you can uh, see the output. And this is what one example from the uh, data set looked like. So we have uh, this, this the class in this case, so uh, recreation.autos, which is something about cars. Um, and we have a header from each method, which is from uh, what who posted it, uh, what the subject of this posting is, a bit of meta information. And then we have the actual text. And we have a footer. Um, and in some cases, we also have quotes done here. If, you're, for example, the person replied to some other post, the other post will be included here as reference. Of course, this metadata and this footer and also these quotes are not very interesting to us as our classifier could very quickly overfit on this metadata. For example, if certain people only tend to post in one certain category, for example, this person only posts about cars, um, our classifier could very click quickly learn that whenever he sees this mail address, he's going to assign this class. And therefore, we are going to invoke this remove option uh, when loading the data set from sklearn. So headers, photos, and quotes are removed automatically. And just like that, our data looks much cleaner. So we only have the actual text here. However, text itself is not really understandable um, for our machine learning classifier. So what we need to do is turn it into um, turn it into some way of machine-readable form, um, which means we need to vectorize or we need to engineer features. We're going to use the count vectorizer of sklearn, and what the count vectorizer does is that it represents every single of these news group postings as a vector of token counts. So it figures out what the common vocabulary of all these postings is and then builds a giant uh, document term matrix where each cell denotes how often does this term occur in this document. And of course, we can have a look at this as well. So let me just quickly comment this out and print D. Um, so we can now see that each document uh, is one line in, in this data set. And uh, this list and zip just concatenates each representation of a document with its target class. So for example, the first, uh, the first document, um, this array now holds only zeros because the six terms, the six columns we actually see here, the rest is omitted, uh, don't really occur in this document. But for example, you can see down here, um, for this document, we have five occurrences of this term. I don't really know what this term is. I think it's uh, arbitrary or random, the order of terms. Um, and it also has the class seven. So, Class seven, as we saw before, is about uh, motorsports and cars. So this is what our um, data now looks like. We have transformed it into a feature representation, and in our case, this is just token counts. There are many more things uh, to, or more approaches to representing text, which we might will have a look at later. Um, but for now, just token counts are enough. Okay, the other new concept compared to vectorization and text data is that we, for this week, want to actually perform a train test split. So in the last week, um, we evaluated our classifier on the training data itself, which of course yields very promising results. Um, but this is not really indicative of real-world performance for our classifier. So in this week, we want to improve on that setup 
and actually split our data into two subsets. One contains 80%, the other contains 20% of the data. And then we want to train only on this 80% subset and then evaluate on the 20% subset, uh, which the classifier has never seen before. And this should give us a more robust approximation of the actual performance of our data. Keep in mind that uh, this split should be random, so it is good practice to just shuffle um, our data set before we split it. And then we can just use the uh, Python build in indexing uh, functions. So dtrain is d, but we only want everything up to 80%, so the length of d times 0.8. Since indexing is integer-based, we need to cast it down to an integer. And then in the same way, the training set uh, is times 0.2, but this time we don't, it, uh, no, it needs to stay 0.8, but we want everything after that index. Um, and we can very quickly verify that this is correct by calling len on the train and the test and the original data set. And we can see that if we yeah, have this as well, let's put a plus here so we don't have to do it in our heads. We can see that this is now evenly divided between the two. Okay, so I can use this the train data set for training, and then when we come to evaluation, we will call back to this the test data set. As I already said, the goal is to develop a naive base classification algorithm. And at its base, it's conceptually very, very simple but it has some implications for implementing um, that we will get to in a minute. But basically this whole formula in contains everything we need to know. Um, so PA is the prior probability, or it's an actual term for it, of each class. So how often does each class occur as a, as a baseline measure? And then we have uh, these terms, PJ, uh, P from BJ of a, um, or the probability of the class given a feature, um, which can be composed later into this term over here, this is called the posterior probability. Um, so the first step for us is to estimate both these prior probabilities and also these posterior probabilities. Let's start with the prior probabilities. We have given this function signature already, so we just get the training data set. And we want a one-dimensional array of size n classes. So since we have 20 classes, we will have a 20-dimensional array. And each cell in this array should denote the prior probability of the class that corresponds to that index. Um, so to find out the prior probability, we just need to calculate the ratio of how often the class occurs and how much samples there are in general. And to count things, we can use uh, the handy numpy function, um, which is numpy.unique, which counts unique occurrences. And in our case, d consists of um, the feature representation in the class. And right now, we only are interested in the class label. So we will write a very short list comprehension to get the first uh, index element for every element in D. And to actually get the counts of each of these uh, individual classes, we will supply this optional argument return counts equals two. And we will for now just return both to see if all this worked. So let's quickly call it on D train. And we can see that it returns two arrays, one which consists of the uh, class names and the other one which consists of uh, the different numbers of occurrences of each of these classes. So class zero occurs 382 times, class one occurs 477 times, and class two, and so on. However, we want the probability, not the true counts. So we uh, need to divide this count data um, by the total number of uh, instances. We can first get rid of this argument. We don't need the names. Uh, these are index-based anyway, so we can always quickly uh, reconstruct them. And then we are going to just look at the counts and normalize them. We can just do counts divided by 
counts.sum, which will give us the uh, total number uh, of, of instances. And as you can see here, now we have uh, the actual probabilities in our set. So class one occurs with a probability of about 5%. This data set is approximately balanced. So all of the 20 classes are approximately one divided by 20, so 5% uh, of the cases. Um, there are some outliers. Uh, the last class 20 has a bit fewer, the first class has a bit fewer, but in general, they are about 5%. So this seems to be correct for now. The next step is to estimate the posterior probabilities, though the probability of a class given a feature. And actually, I see that there yeah, is an error here. This should be the other way around. So this should be class A of uh, given B, not the other way around. Um, and to do that, we essentially do a very similar thing to above, but now we do it not over all the uh, features, not over all the classes, but over all the features. Um, so we need a bit more setup code here. First thing to know for us is all the different classes. So we will uh, disassemble our data set into classes and features. Um, we will use the same list comprehension as before. So x1 for x and d um, is our um, our class label. And then we also have feature matrix, which is a NumPy array on just the feature representation of each document. And the, um, I will quick, you already saw the class representation before. I will quickly show the feature matrix uh, just so you know what it actually looks like under the hood. Uh, wait, there's an R, so posterior is D. Of course, this feature matrix is really large. Um, can see that uh, we have about 11,000 documents and we have a total of 32,000 words. So each document is represented by a 32,000 dimensional uh, vector with token counts. Most of these are zeros anyway, um, but they are, get really large the more uh, terms you have in your vocabulary. The next thing we need to figure out uh, is the number of classes. Uh, so n classes equals the unique number of classes. And we can just take the uh, shape of this vector. And we also want to know the number of features, which we already printed down here. So we can just do feature matrix dot shape. And we want the uh, first value in this tuple, which is the 32,000. Then we can allocate in uh, empty array uh, for our posterior probabilities. So we do n dot zeros. And this should be as specified up here of the shape n classes by n features. Um, so these are the numbers we figured out up here. Now we want to figure out what the actual probabilities are. And we do that individually for each class. So for i in range n classes, so actually this i could be a c to be more speaking, but I'll leave it as an i by convention. Um, and we can figure out each row at a time. So for this class, um, so we basically loop over the number of classes so from 1 to 20. And we want to access the row in our posterior probability, posterior probability, and row i now equals the feature matrix. Um, and we only want the rows of the feature matrix that correspond to that class. And um, this right here, if you remember from our NumPy notebook, is Boolean based indexing. So we compare our class array. If it's i, so we get a true for every line that corresponds to this class and a false for every line that does not correspond to this class. And if we index the feature matrix uh, in that way, we get only the rows that have uh, i. And we just want to sum up these rows. So we um, look at all documents of this class and uh, count how often does each feature, so each term in, in our case, 
um, occur for that class. Uh, we can actually look at the output as it is right there. So posterior probability is just returned. And we can this will yeah, we can see that uh, now our matrix is much more dense. Um, we have a lot of more values than before. For example, for class one, term two occurred 17 times over all documents. Again, we want to normalize this. We don't need the raw count data, we want to normalize it. Um, so we can do that right in the return statement. We will divide this um, by just the uh, posterior probability, the row wise uh, sum. So we take the sum of each of these rows, we normalize per class, um, and take the sum. This I will execute it once, will it an error? Uh, because we are trying to um, divide an array of shape 20, 32,000 by an array of shape 20, um, which should be the other way around. So they are compatible, they should be. Uh, uh, Called transposed to each other. So just simply shift this around by calling reshape minus one one. And now it works without a problem. And we can see, of course, in scientific notation now, because the probabilities get very, very small, um, that we have normalized uh, probabilities here. Okay, so given uh, these um, Probabilities, the priors and the posteriors, and there's again the error over here that it should be this, or is it? Yeah. So bj given a. Uh, wait, it was correct, sorry. It's not because we need to fix it before. This was wrong too, but this is actually correct if we look at this. Um, so we can now assemble the classifier. So we want to predict, uh, write a predict function that, given the test data set to D, um, based on the prior and posterior probabilities, and an alpha value, and I will get to what the alpha value does in a second, um, we want to return the class probabilities for each of these. Things. So, what we want to do here um, is implement this formula up here. So we want to calculate this probability for each document. And we already have this part, and we also have all of these parts, or rather, we have this part right here. So we just need to perform this sum down here and the product up here. So the first thing we will do is, as before, we just for convenience calculate how many classes we have. So posterior shape zero, and we calculate how many samples we have. So how many need, do we need to predict? This is just the length of our data set. And we pre-allocate the NumPy array, uh, let's use zeros, um, which has the shape samples classes. And this will be our output. So at some point, we will return predictions. Now, we could use priors and posteriors as they are here right now. However, there's a small problem. Um, and this is not mentioned in the lecture, because in theory, this works optimally. Um, but when implementing this in practice, it's a nice little hack, which I'll explain. Um, so we have a we have a product up here, and that means whenever we encounter a term that has never occurred for a class, so whenever we have in our posterior probabilities a zero, if we now in the test data which contains different combinations of classes and uh, features compared to the training data, if this test data contains a document that has class A of I which in the training data has never consisted of the term b, if this new document now contains b, this term will be zero. And in turn, the complete product will be zero as well. And that means whenever I encounter a word for a class that has never been encountered in the training data, um, my prediction 
cannot predict that class because the probability will always be zero. No matter what other terms are in the document, as soon as I encounter a single zero, my probability will be zero as well. And this leads to the problem that our naive base classification in practice is not very robust against unseen data. So it's mathematically better if we only evaluate one training data. But since we on this week did this train test split up here, um, we might encounter the case that uh, the test set contains uh, class term combinations that were never seen in the training data and which will then lead to this mentioned um, multiplication by zero problem. So the way around this is that we just add a very, very small number, in this case uh, 0.000001, I think, so six zeros and one, um, to our priors and posteriors. So priors equals priors plus alpha, and posteriors equals posteriors. Keep in mind this uh, is not part of the formal description of naive base, but it's a nice hack in practice to increase the performance of a classifier. So this is not in the lecture slides, but I hope that the explanation I gave here is understandable. Um, okay, we did all the prep work, so now we want to build our classifier. And we do that for each document at a time. So for um, an index and the feature representation small x, and I use the lecture notation here and see uh, in our data set. And this enumeration is a built in Python function that just adds this index, otherwise, we would just get x and c. Um, we first need to figure out which terms occur. So, right now in this input data x, we have the counts. Um, so whenever the count is above zero, um, this term occurs, and if not, it's not. We can simplify this to just a Boolean array by casting uh, x dot s type bool. So now it will be true whenever there is a positive value and zero whenever there is a zero. So the prediction for this document equals the product of our posteriors. And here we only use the terms that actually occur in our, uh, in our data because all the other terms, since they don't occur, are, uh, have a zero probability anyways. And then um, we only want to multiply along axis one. And this is then just multiplied by the priors. The probability sum, which refers to this sum down here, so we have the uh, upper part. This is right now in our uh, predictions array already saved. We now build the sum and then uh, normalize our prediction array. Um, so what we're going to do here is to build the probability sum, which equals predictions i dot sum. And we just divide by this probability sum. And this is a nice little hack. We have this uh, optional argument right here, return probability. So um, we can switch between returning the actual probabilities. So this will be, let me get this up here. If this is true, we will return the actual uh, probabilities as they are now. In any other case, if it's false, uh, we will return the class label. So if we just take the argmax of our predictions and we want this for each document, so along the row wise axis. And I think this should work. Uh, so let me quickly test this. Um, we want the priors from the train. We want the posteriors from the train. And for debugging, we want to return the probabilities. So let's see if this works out of the box. Uh, no, we have a name error. Uh, posterior is not defined. Oh, I'm missing an S somewhere. Let's see. Um, which line is it? Ah, posterior shape right here. 
So now it will work. No, there's another one. The current probability is not defined. Ah, okay, I'm missing another S. Oops. So now, yeah. And this looks discouraging. Um, we have a lot of weird errors here. And uh, this, um, is because we run into an overflow issue. So the, the or underflow, I think, is it rather here. Um, you see all these infinity and NIN values. And what this means is we do the product of very, very small numbers. And so the numbers get smaller and smaller and smaller up to the point that we can't represent them in a 64-bit integer anymore. Um, so our probabilities, at least before normalizing them, are so small that the computer cannot handle the degree of uh, precision that we require for this task. And this leads to us observing all of these NIN values right here. There's another thing which I think is in the solution. Uh, we put at an alpha value here again. So we can do uh, alpha. So in any case where uh, this gets too small, we just add alpha to it. It still doesn't help because um, even adding this alpha value doesn't give us uh, get us over the uh, edge where we actually um, yeah where we actually uh, get real values anymore. So we need to find another way around this. What can we do? We can switch to log space. And I will shortly show this Wikipedia um, explanation. I hope they have a graph. Oh, they do not. Let's look at, yep, yeah. okay. So all our probabilities are between zero and one. And the problem with these is that if I multiply a number between zero and one by zero and one, or by num another number between zero and one, this new number will be much smaller. And this just stacks up by multiplication. However, in log space, number between zero and one actually becomes a number between minus infinity and zero. So we have whole numbers again. And with whole numbers, we can work to a much higher degree of precision because we can fit many more, um, many bigger, uh, much bigger numbers into, into our computer. So if we convert our probabilities into log probabilities, which is what the linked Wikipedia article is about, um, we can actually gain three things, which are listed here. I don't want to generate right now. So we gain speed. Um, that is because addition and multiplication and also division work slightly different in log space. If you remember from uh, your math uh, at school, if I take the logarithm of the multiplication, I can also do the logarithm of the division numbers and add them. And there's also a nice uh, way of performing addition in log space, um, which is already implemented in our notebook here, just so you don't have to implement it yourself. And so if we transform our probabilities, which are very small numbers, into, um, into log space, so if we copy this whole classifier right here to down here, and we do np.log right here, we get numbers that behave much, much nicer. However, we also need to adhere to the new operations in log space. So this is product right now, but in log space, each multiplication actually becomes an addition. So in our case, we should replace that, um, wait, wrong tab, yeah. Uh, we should replace that product with a sum. And again, this multiplication right here, we can also replace with a sum. The same we can do for predictions. So predictions are right now a sum, but in log space, addition looks slightly different. So we have this uh, log edge function here, which if you would cast the Right, I can very shortly demonstrate this so it makes more sense. 
So A, uh, let's do 3 plus 3, and this of course equals 6. And we can also do np.log of 3 plus np.log of 3. And we can't use normal addition here anymore. But if we do log at, and we'll execute this like this once, this, we get some real value, but if we cast this back to the original real number space from log space, we get our six again. So this is just a nifty way of converting between the two spaces and doing all of our operations in log space where we don't run into this precision problem. And then at the final our result, we cast it back to our probabilities because at this point they are they hopefully got so large that they are representable uh, in actual space anymore. Uh, or again. We somehow need to replace this sum operation down here using this log at, and this is the perfect opportunity to do some functional programming using uh, the reduce operator. So what reduce does is, if you haven't uh, seen this in some of the other programming courses, if I call reduce on this, for example, with addition as a function, it will take the first element, to the second, save the result, at the third to this result, save it again, at the fourth to this result, so it will be the running sum would be one, then three, then six, and then ten. And we can use that down here. So if we call reduce, and as a function we want log add, and we want to reduce the predictions array, then we now have here the uh, log sum of our log predictions. And finally, we have this uh, division here. And as you could already see here, I'm not sure if it's mentioned, but it's the inverse of, um, uh, of the uh, multiplication addition thing. Our division becomes minus or subtraction. Okay, um, now we can cast this back to our original space. And we can also cast this back right here. So depending on what kind of data we want, um, we get either the probabilities or the most likely class. Let's check if we didn't implement any bugs while converting this to log space. And we still have an error. Why do we still have an error? Oh, okay. Ah, yeah. We are calling the wrong function. So we are calling the predict uh, from up here. Actually, this should be predict log. Because we copy pasted it before. So now it should actually call our predict log. Oh, okay, this is missing the return probabilities keyword. So we will. Let me quickly add that. And let's see, we encounter an overflow, which is uncertain. Uh, so this is not as nice because at some point uh, we add a lot of negative numbers and they add up quickly. So we still run into trouble, but we can see that in a lot of cases we actually get usable numbers here. So let's see. Um, if our classifier is uh, robust. So I will just use the sklearn uh, evaluation report. So from sklearn.metrics import classification report and print the classification report. Um, let's call this P and return the most likely class. So this is false. And we also need our true labels. So we need something to compare our predictions to. And this is just uh, the class label for every document in D. Ah, right, we need to run this once more. Uh, 
Um, ah, I put this bracket in too early. This should be here. Ah, okay. Um, we did another. Why do we have an error here? Let me investigate quickly. So down here, we get P and P has an incompatible shape. Let's quickly investigate that shape. So P has a shape 11,000, which is not what we are. Ah, yeah, the error is here. This is called X, um, or we want it to be D. There's an argument to be made here that you can call it x since the prediction function shouldn't know about this c label right here. Um, so actually, this should like this if you implement it with d, or if you implement it with x, um, then uh, you, yeah, you uh, can just omit this unpacking here. I will cast both of these to be of the same signature. So I'm going to use uh, d and just ignore this value. Um, and I will be sure to update the, uh, the notebooks after this recording. I think they are still in the X version on the website. So now our shape is correct and we can actually evaluate. And we can see that our classificator is quite bad. Why is that the case? I think we still have a bug somewhere. Ah, yeah, I found the error. We had now we modify every single row, so we had we are we are missing this uh, index here. Uh, sorry for missing that while implementing in the first place. If we don't have this, um, we take the whole prediction matrix and deduct probability sum, which will make our probabilities smaller and smaller and smaller. And this is also why we still encounter these overflow issues. But wait, uh, if we only do this for the row we are currently looking at, so if we normalize by uh, document and not normalize over all documents, these warnings should, in theory, okay, they are at least reduced, and we only get an overflow somewhere in this edition. Which makes sense because it could be the case that we just exceed um, the maximum precision even in log space. And there's nothing we can really do about that besides increasing the um, precision we work at. So from 64 bit integers uh, to 128 bit integers. But I think this is overkill for this uh, lesson right here. And hopefully, yeah, now that we've fixed this uh, normalization bug, um, we can see that our classifier actually performs as expected. And um, we get an overall accuracy of 0.7, which given that naive base is a really, really simple approach to classifying data, um, looks pretty promising. As a last thing for this week, I, will, I would like to highlight um, the comparison to last week again, where we evaluated on the, um, on the training set. So I will call this once more, but instead of evaluating on the test set, I will now train and evaluate on the training set. Um, and we can see that in this case, our accuracy is much higher on the training data as on the test data, which means that our classifier tends to overfit a little bit on the training data, um, which, given that it's naive base, is to be expected. Since naive base tries to replicate, or since it's a generative classifier tries to replicate the training data as closely as possible. Um, and but we can also see that our features are not completely independent, which means that even the naive, the naive base assumption, which in the if it's in the perfect world should reach an accuracy of one point zero, because it can perfectly explain or replicate or rather generate the uh, training data. But since we have some features that occur with each other, so if, uh, they are um, correlated, we don't get maximum. Okay, I hope that uh, this has given you some insight into how Naive Base works. 
Um, again, I apologize for having all these weird bugs up here for missing that, for example. Um, but yeah, hope that you still got some insight into debugging. Um, and see you in the next programming class.